I will officially call the Agriculture Finance and Policy Committee meeting to order on January 10th, 2023. Uh, there is a quorum present. Uh, I'm very happy to be back in person and see uh, some uh, familiar faces as well as some new ones. Welcome back to the committee and to new ones, welcome. Uh, I am Chair Vang. I've been uh, on this committee since being elected. This is my third term. Um, and I represent the Brooklands. And so first, uh, I would like to start off with members and staff introductions, um, and then uh, we can uh, go on with our agenda. Um, and uh, first, let's start with staff. Uh, the people on this uh, table uh, are who I like to call the A-team, and they will be crucial in making sure that uh, our committee is functioning well and going smoothly. Um, so we, let's start with our CA. Hi, I'm Amanda Rudolph. This is my 11th year at the House, and I have covered state government, local government, elections, and government operations. And uh, this year I have state gov and agriculture committee. Then I'm Matthew Souser. I'm the committee legislative assistant for the agriculture committee. And then nonpartisan staff, Colby. Yeah, hello, everybody. I'm Colby Sullivan with the nonpartisan House Research Department. Uh, this is my 18th year with the legislature, and I've staffed the Agriculture Committee throughout. And I'll tell you all a little bit more about my role in a few minutes. And then Mr. Ken Savory. Uh, good, morning. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Ken Savory, nonpartisan uh, House Fiscal Analysis Department. This is my ninth year at the House and eighth year covering uh, agriculture. I also cover higher education and the new economic development. <coughs> All right, and Bennett? Bennett Smith, DFL Research. This is my 10th year at the House and my fifth year with the Ag Committee. And then Mark? Mark Nicely, Republican Caucus Research. I cover this committee and climate and energy. All right, thank you. Uh, oh, and we have uh, our page. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Yes, you can take a mic. Uh, my name is Zach Cullen. I'm the committee page. This is my first year here, and I'm very excited to work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, and then we can start with member introductions. Uh, Representative uh, Anderson, would you like to take the lead? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm uh, Representative Paul Anderson, live up uh, about 150 miles northwest of here, close to where Bennett's, some of your family's from. Um, I represent an area from the South Dakota border. Uh, to the east, uh, nearly to St. Cloud, so a long, narrow district that uh, changed considerably with redistricting. So District 12A is my, my district. I'm a farmer, and, and this is my um, eighth term starting here at St. Paul, so glad to be here. And then we can just go down the line, Representative. Representative John Burkle, District 1A. I've got the very northwest corner, a little farther north, Paul, about 300 miles north, 360 actually. Um, Turkey producer, fourth generation farmer, um, and glad to be representing Northwest Minnesota. Uh, Nathan Nelson, this is my uh, third term in the legislature. I represent uh, District 11B. That's uh, Pine, part of Pine County, half of Kanabit County, and a couple of townships in Chisago. And I am a farmer and uh, proud to be here. Hi, my name is Bobby Harder, and I represent 17B, which includes the counties of Sibley, Carver, and McLeod. And I am a farmer, and we grow corn and soybeans. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair Vang. So um, my name is Steve Jacob. Uh, I represent District 20B. I'm a fourth-generation family farmer. I'm coming off of uh, my 10th year on the Winona County Board of Commissioners. So uh, I've been very active with... Uh, Soil and Water Conservation Districts and uh, Whitewater Joint Powers Board, a lot of water and land use uh, committees that I've sat on. So, uh, so yeah, anyhow, uh, uh, Winona, Rochester area is where I'm from. Thank you. Thank you. And then Representative Rick Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Rick Hansen, I represent uh, South St. Paul, Invergrove Heights, Newport, St. Paul Park, part of Cottage Grove and part of Great Cloud Island Township. So it's a new district. I've been here since uh, being elected 
in 2004. I grew up on a farm in Freeborn County where I'm still actively engaged in that, as well as uh, having a farm in Fillmore County where my mom was from. So I've uh, been involved in agriculture uh, a long time, been on this committee I think my whole time here. So glad to be here. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Brad Tapke. This is my second time on the Ag Committee. I uh, farm kid, 4-H kid from Northwest Iowa, and uh, now represent Shakopee, so thank you. Hi there, I'm Christy Purcell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I represent 58A in the Northfield, Lonsdale, Dundas, north half of New Prague area. Um, my spouse farmed for about 10 years, uh, diversified vegetables, and then commercial cut flowers. And I've worked a lot um, in the ag space with the Cannon River Watershed Partnership, now called Clean River Partners. Good afternoon. My name is Lucy Ream. I'm a new member here. Um, I'm a fourth generation Minnesotan. Uh, my parents grew up on farms, and I represent 48B, which is Chanhassen and Chaska. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Luke Frederick, District 18B, which is May, uh, South Central Minnesota, Mankato, Eagle Lake, and Skyline, second term in the legislature, first time on the committee. I'm excited to be here. My, na my name is Samantha Sensormura. I am a new legislator from South Minneapolis. This is my first term, um, and I have been involved with some urban farms in South Minneapolis. Ethan, Ethan Shaw from uh, Woodbury 47B. Uh, my parents have farms since we've been here in the United States. I'm a former uh, cattle rancher, heifers and steers, horseman, and uh, hay farmer. And I'm humbled to be here. All right. Thank you, members. Uh, I would just like to say that I look forward to doing great work in this committee. Uh, I've had the honor and privilege to uh, serve with former chairs, uh, and I've enjoyed uh, co collaboration and the bipartisanship this committee has offered. Uh, I really do think that uh, this committee can do it all, from big ag to small ag. Um, it's, it's possible. And so, um, you know, farmers represent about less than 2% of the Minnesota population, and yet 100% of us eat or have benefit from the work of our farmers. Uh, so farmers are truly our backbone of Minnesota, and uh, I am very excited about uh, what this community can do, um, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you. Uh, and with that said, uh, I uh, will get started on the next agenda item, uh, is by our nonpartisan staff overview by Mr. Colby Sullivan. Oh, sorry, before, before uh, we start with that, Mr. Uh, Sullivan, um, just wanna make a quick note that uh, the rules and procedures of the committee uh, were emailed and posted on the committee webpage. Um, and uh, of course, uh, as chair, um, I do have authority to waive uh, these rules uh, if under consultation, and so I'm open to that as well. So thank you. If uh, any members have any questions, Representative Anderson. Madam Chair, thank you. You and I had a discussion uh, about a week or so, I guess, uh, about the deadline for amendments, and you, you texted me. Could you clarify a little bit more? Um, is it going to be uh, by incident, or what is the deadline going to be for amendments uh, going forward? 9 a.m., the day before committee. With Madam Chair, with possible exceptions, or what was your, your message? Yeah, with possible exceptions, I do have the right to waive these rules uh, under consultation, of course, with you too, uh, Representative Anderson. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, then we can get started with the next agenda item. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, just a couple brief comments from me before I turn it over to Mr. Sabry, who has some slides prepared for the overview presentation. Just a note that with um, the House Research Department, I draft bills and amendments for all 134 members of the House. So one of the areas I specialize in is obviously agriculture. So if you have agriculture bills or amendments that you need drafted, please feel free to reach out to me or have Mr. Smith or Mr. Nisley get in touch. We work pretty closely together as we prepare documents for this committee. Also, if you have research needs, uh, legal research, uh, policy, fiscal research in the agriculture area, please reach out. I usually work with my colleague, Mr. Savory, on anything fiscal related, since he's the fiscal analyst. But uh, please feel free to be in touch, and I look forward to working with you all. Thanks. 
and then Mr. Saber. Uh, Madam Chair and members, I'm going to take you through a set of slides that were included in your packet today. Um, it's titled the Council Overview Agricultural Finance. Um, it's about, about 11, 12 slides. Um, it's just a high level overview of the committee's jurisdiction. I um, wanted to get you all familiar with some of the numbers um, with the agencies. And um, then we'll, uh, you can go down that road in terms of uh, more in depth at a later date. But just for a brief overview. First, first slide, um, just kind of an overview of what the accounts are for this particular committee. So some of them are obvious, some of them are kind of not. Uh, so the Department of Agriculture, the Board of Animal Health, the um, AURI, the Agricultural Utilization Research Board, the Horticultural, Horticultural Society, which is kind of a remnant of a historic appropriation that is now folded into the Department of Agriculture, but we kind of list it just to make sure everyone's aware of it. And then new to this committee this year is the Deed Office of Broadband. Um, typically in the past, um, omnibus bills that have gone to the governor have included um, speed offs of broadband appropriations or broadband appropriations more generally. They can often be in other committees, and under this committee's setup, they are now within this committee's jurisdiction and part of our base funding. So looking over the page once more, um, just wanted to say a few words about a handful of accounts um, more specifically related to finances. Um, so most of the appropriations that this committee will be dealing with will be from the general fund. Uh, so you may be thinking about bills that you're drafting now. Typically, those will be X number of dollars for a specific purpose um, from the general fund for a specific number of years or amount of years. Um, that's what we typically work with the most, and that's where all of the uh, taxes within the state, the vast majority, go and are deposited. Um, the second fund more specific to um, this committee is the agricultural fund. A good example of that is when producers pay fees for an inspection, those fees go into a certain account within the agricultural fund. It could be eggs, um, something specific like that. It could be something more specific like grain. And then the department runs that program using the money that is, that is appropriate to that account. Um, remediation fund, this is, a, this is a fund in which the uh, committee works with somewhat, but, but not really. There is some money in the ag ag budget based for remediation fund. It's essentially a voluntary cleanup program, um, chemical cleanup, um, things like that. Federal funds, that's pretty obvious, won't go into other things there. And there's also another um, fund called the Special Revenue Fund. And the Special Revenue Fund is kind of similar to the agricultural fund, but it's less based um, in terms of agricultural um, items. It'd be things like for fees, not related to agriculture. It's kind of what to think about it. Moving on. I want to generally talk quickly about uh, three appropriation types that the committee will be uh, using throughout the year. Um, direct appropriation, as described there on those two bullets, I won't go through it directly um, or in detail, but it's essentially when, as I said before, a specific amount of money directly appropriated through a department, in this case, three within our jurisdiction or four within our jurisdiction, and then for a specific period of time, usually within a biennium, biennium being uh, two fiscal years. Uh, statutory appropriation is similar to the direct appropriation, but is in statute as opposed to the direct appropriation being in session law. So the statutory appropriation is automatic, doesn't need to be renewed every budget year, but it happens automatically. And then flipping over, just the last one, the open appropriation, very similar to the statute, statutory appropriation. It can be often um, thought about as uh, things like funding necessary for a certain for a certain task. So in the environment area, there's an open appropriation for firefighting, meaning that the legislature doesn't have to act in order to um, take care of fires that happen on public lands. And flipping the um, page over one more time, um, I just want to provide you all a pie chart to give you a sense um, of the ag budget as compared to the rest of the budget. So this is a pie graph of the 2023-22-23 Biden General Fund spending um, taken from the November forecast, which happened a handful of weeks ago. Um, so if you just kind of go down the side, you'll see various kind of percentages pulled out. And you'll see agriculture and housing, jobs, deed and commerce, those are typically, typically kind of put together on one line in, in the uh, general fund balance. But when you spread them apart, you can kind of see that although there are millions and millions of dollars being spent on ag, um, comparison to other areas, it is different. And kind of the point here is that when the pieces of the pie change, so do the percentages change when you talk about um, various pieces of the pie. 
So as B12 education gets larger, <coughs> as Health and Human Services get larger, it can reduce other pieces of the pie. So every appropriation this committee makes can affect the amount of money available for other purposes. Um, looking over to the next slide, this is, this is a chart, kind of a longitudinal chart of um, appropriations or general, general expenditures for the ag area. Now because um, broadband, broadband appropriations have been in and out of this area, I took those out for the purposes of this graph, but I just want to give people kind of a historical view of what appropriations have been like in this area. I wanted to point out too in FY 2000-2001, uh, that was the height of the ethanol payments that were made through this committee. And so you see appropriations kind of rose sharply there, kind of peaked. And then as those, pro those appropriations, those ethanol payments kind of went away, um, there was kind of a valley out. You'll see some peaks and valleys with the um, 08 09 recession. And then gradually, kind of recovery, more appropriations, more dollars coming into agriculture as we get into 14, 15, and kind of, and kind of onward. You'll notice at the end of the pipe, at the end of the line, you'll see FY24, 25, and FY26, 27. Those are from, taken from the November forecast. And those represent what can be kind of referred to as current law. So if this committee said, what are we looking at in terms of going forward? Those two biomes, that's what would happen. Um, and kind of what you'll see is that in FY24, 25, you'll see about $146 million for ag, and then that really drops off in FY26, 27. And the reason being is that under current law, one of the divisions within agriculture known as agri, which we'll hear about, um, hear about later, is expiring. And therefore that $32 million kind of comes off of that line, and you'll see that number go down. So this committee will have to make decisions about what to, what to do with that expiration. So just an FYI as we move forward. Uh, flipping the page one more time, I just want to talk generally about um, the Agriculture Omnibus Finance Bill, which is probably arguably the largest bill this committee will see and uh, pass um, in terms of ag finances. Just kind of lay out, kind of lay the land in terms of how it's all put together. So it'll be an appropriation article and probably a policy article as well. So just talking specifically about the appropriation article. You'll have appropriations for the Department of Agriculture. Those appropriations are made by division. So there are four divisions at MDA, and so those will be appropriations for promotion protection services, promotion and marketing, value-added product, which consists of GREET and AGRI, and then um, admin and financial assistance. The three other areas within our jurisdiction um, the Board of Animal Health, AURI, and DEED will also have appropriations, but they'll be, but they don't necessarily have divisions. Those are essentially appropriated directly to the um, department or the agency. Moving on to the uh, next slide, I just want to provide two slides on the most recent omnibus bills that came uh, before this committee and then, uh, went to the governor's desk. So just kind of looking at the 2021 uh, session overview of uh, Ag and Rural Development Finance. As you'll see here, you'll see on the left-hand side of the chart, you see the various agencies listed within our jurisdiction. And two columns I want to focus on are kind of right in the middle. One says forecast-based FY22-23, and the other says enacted FY22-23. Um, at, at the legislature, typically we do base budgeting, meaning, meaning we look at the previous appropriations and then decide whether to increase, increase them, uh, remove them, or uh, reduce them. And so if you take the number, um, 127 million and 137 million, that difference is $10 million. So you can see that the legislature appropriated an additional $10 million in FY22-23 in the last um, omnibus finance bill. <coughs> and the last column I'll kind of point out is um, the column all the way to the right-hand side, which is FY24-25 um, enacted. This is what's known as the tails. So this is kind of the bill's projection what the next biennium is going to be in the future. For, so for 26 or so, for 24, 25, at this period in time, happening in 2021, so a handful of years ago now, um, it was going to be what was in FY 22, 23, so a little change. Sometimes that can go up, sometimes that can go down, depending on what the contents of the bill is. I'll flip over briefly um, one more time to the 2022 session overview. Um, you can see the label is agriculture, drought, and broadband. This is one of the few kind of larger finance bills that passed the legislature this last session in 2022. Um, I won't go into any depth here, but I just want to make you aware of kind of the, the bigger buckets um, that, happened last, that happened last session. 
And notice that if you compare the FY2223 column, so it's $51 million, to FY2425, so it's $32 million, that kind of fall, that kind of a sharp difference tells you that a lot of the money in FY2223 was one time, and therefore it did not carry forward into FY2425. Hence why we looked at the line graph, that number was going down. So we'll flip over one more time, this is my last slide. I just want to remind, um, remind members and kind of introduce the concept of uh, the budget and active timeline. So you'll see kind of various um, tick boxes on the left-hand side of the column. You can kind of pick those off as we go throughout the session. So, we're, so where we are now is we're in January, the legislature's convened, um, the governor's about to make his budget recommendations approximately um, on January 24th, or about there, or thereabouts. Um, in February, the uh, February economic forecast will be released by MMB. They'll give us a new set of numbers, and we start building the budget from there. And then in March, uh, the Ways and Means Committee, as well as the Senate Majority, will release various um, spending targets, so how much money each committee is allocated or each purpose is allocated. And then in April, um, various omnibus finance bills will leave this committee, go to Ways and Means, go to the House floor, and they'll start conference committee with the Senate and the executive branch. And then additionally in May, um, conference committees will at some point adjourn, reach solution, and then um, those reports will go back to the House floor, the House of Origin, House or Senate, and then the legislature will adjourn in, in uh, mid to late May. Um, and then the governor will have a decision on where to sign or be those, those bills. So Madam Chair, um, that kind of wraps up a brief introduction of our council of and finances. Thank you, Mrs. Savory. Questions from the committee? All right. Uh, the next, we have uh, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture uh, presentation. Commissioner Tom Peterson, welcome to the committee. Good to see you again. Please uh, identify yourself before the committee and uh, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, for the record, my name is Tom Peterson. I serve as uh, Commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, present on our uh, behalf of our agency today. I'm joined by our Deputy Commissioner, Andrea Vobel, and if I could just real quickly introduce our other commissioners who are here today. Uh, Peter Chesset is our uh, Assistant Commissioner, along with uh, Commissioner Patrice Bailey, and our Director of Government Relations, uh, Michelle Medina, uh, also right here. So they'll be working with all of you and uh, available to all of you as you uh, look into uh, questions or thoughts you have with the, with the uh, different areas that we cover and everything. So uh, there it all. Oh, looking for a PowerPoint. Uh. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, uh, Sorry about that, and uh, and uh, we'll just work off of the copy. I think you all have a copy of it, then. Okay, all right. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of to, to kind of set the uh, space again. Tom Peterson, Commissioner. I've uh, had the honor of serving Commissioner for the last four years. The governor uh, reappointed me, uh, and so I really appreciate that opportunity to serve. Been really uh, pleased to work with the committee the last four years to pass some really. Uh, Great bills, uh, omnibus bills, uh, mostly on time and mostly bipartisan. Appreciate the uh, the work that we've done and through unprecedented times. I think about, you know, when we, when you came in in uh, 2019, we were just talking with Representative Nelson uh, about uh, barn collapses. We had heavy snow that spring. Uh, uh, 2019 continued into a very wet year where we had almost a million acres that did get planted uh, in the western part of the state. 2020. Uh, of course, uh, we had COVID, which really tipped our food system upside down. 2021, we had the worst drought we've had in uh, nearly 45 years. Uh, and then 2022, uh, we continued with high path avian influenza 
and we had a drought that got into uh, later into the fall. So you just think about the through those challenges, though, we've been able to find a lot of great opportunities. So I just want to give you a quick uh, highlight of agriculture in Minnesota. And then as we go into our divisions, Minnesota has 67,400 farms. So you think about that in a population of 5.7 million people. Uh, you think about what, what qualifies you to be a farmer in our state. It's a USDA definition is $1,000 of gross income. So you can sell, like me, a couple of goats, a horse, and a load of hay. Uh, you're one of those thousands. So you really get down to uh, Representative, uh, you know, Nelson or Anderson and what that, uh, those farmers generate a lot of income as you can see around the state. <laughs> one of the things we usually do is we balance really close in our crop and uh, livestock sector and cash receipts. Uh, that's, that space has moved a little bit uh, in the last year. Usually it's about eight or nine uh, billion each. The crop sector is up a little bit with uh, prices. And then our exports are very uh, uh, booming this year with, uh, we have strong exports uh, uh, around. On the next slide, I just wanna say, or some of the things where we rank is always interesting. Uh, of course, with Representative Burkle, we rank number one in turkeys, uh, and that's been an issue this past year, but also number one in sugar beets, number two in hogs and uh, dry beans, and you can read that for yourself. Uh, but other important crops like corn, soybeans were very high uh, in the rankings across the state, or across the United States. Uh, challenges and trends on the next slide. You can see uh, drought was the first thing we listed. Uh, oddly enough, the, the drought that we had this last year really, uh, and you can see there is the drought monitor on the right side from the end of December. That comes out every Thursday. Uh, we you know always check that. It's not 100% accurate, but it gives you a good snapshot, and it's what we work off of uh, for when we're considering drought conditions across the state. And you can see uh, where we uh, have drought. It's good, good when we're not in like the D3 or D4, which would be the darker colors. And uh, we were uh, in the fall this year. Um, really, the drought happened uh, after the crop was made this fall uh, for most people. So it, uh, uh, the corn, soybeans uh, had been made, but it did hurt a lot of our fall pasture and our fall hay. Um, that we were trying to uh, get in. So some farmers were, had to dip into that earlier. And we'll see, now we have a lot of water, it's just really gonna depend on what our melt looks like. You know, if we get those nice 40 degree days and a hard freeze at night, nice and slow, but we may be dealing with that as we go. Avian influenza, we mixed, uh, we uh, talked about a lot of something I hope the committee spends some time on. We're likely to have that back again this spring. Uh, you know, 110 uh, affected sites, 4.2 million birds. Uh, land access and emerging farmers, another top priority Commissioner Bailey works on, but you look at just even with the baby boom generation, the amount of land that's going to transfer in Minnesota in the next 20 years, and of course input costs, just like any other business you can see uh, is very uh, high right there. Uh, next slide is our mission. Uh, you can read that, our mission to enhance uh, Minnesotans quality of life. Uh, by equitably ensuring the integrity of our food supply, health of our environment, and the strength and resilience of our agricultural economy. On the next slide, uh, just a quick snapshot of our, we have about 515 employees, that really varies. We have a lot of uh, uh, seasonal employees too that maybe work on emerald ash borer or spongy moth, uh, different uh, types of potato inspections, things like that that are seasonal. Uh, our mission also includes like to promote uh, farm products uh, across the state and local, na uh, state, national, and international markets. We respond to disease and pests and threaten agriculture with natural resources. We inspect grocery stores uh, and convenience stores as well as dairy farms and processing, and we regulate feed mills and fertilizer plants. On the next slide, uh, we talk about our responsibilities. We're the primary, uh, uh, primary state agency responsible for protecting the state's food supply and a key player in protecting uh, the, na the state's natural resources. Uh, and also um, primary agency in supporting and promoting the state's uh, agriculture, industry, and economy. We have uh, seven divisions that you can see there that we're gonna discuss today uh, very briefly. Those are our main divisions and we'll uh, you know, have our different uh, uh, folks in to uh, meet about those two as well.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for the record, my name is Andrea Vavel. I serve as Deputy Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Great to see you all. Um, so Mr. Savory did a great job of going over most of this already, um, but just to go over quickly, um, you'll see in this pie chart the uh, percentages of our uh, funding sources by use and budget activity. So 55% go to protection services, and you'll see to the right um, the various divisions that are covered by that, that funding source. 11% uh, for administration for the agency, and then 34% go to promotion. Uh, and then this breaks us down a little bit uh, for our expenditures by fund. So again, $4.6 million in remediation funding, uh, $32.5 million in legacy, $36.4 in federal funding, so about, 11, uh, about 13%, um, $110.5 million in general fund, which equates to about 38% of our, our, all of our funds, uh, and then $103.6 million in fees paid by customers or uh, the dedicated funds as we talk about or the um, ag and special revenue fund that Mr. Isari referred to. So the first division we're going to talk about is the Ag Marketing and Development Division. Uh, uh, all these are just uh, do great work. And uh, this, this one is, uh, I call it our fun division because they uh, get to tell the story of Minnesota agriculture from top to bottom, all of our different products. We got a great idea and work with our, our folks. That's what they do. And just really exciting to see all the work that they do. You can see on the, uh, on the handout there, because it would be uh, promoting biofuels and renewable chemicals. Ag land preservation is something that's very important. Uh, the seven county metro area, um, uh, uh, the three W's, uh, Winona County is one of them. We have the ag land pres preservation law that we're frankly taking a new look at those laws. We're gonna have some listening sessions this spring, uh, but that's something that they do. Ag literacy, maybe you've heard of Minnesota Ag in the Classroom. It's a tremendous uh, program that the department works through. Farm safety has been a top priority of this committee. As commissioner, I started uh, quarterly meetings on farm safety with the farm groups. Uh, legislators are encouraged to join, but it's a, a very important topic that we have uh, 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 within the, uh, this committee and the Department of Agriculture. And then special projects like drought relief, aquaculture. This is the um, division that put together the 3,000 uh, drought checks this last uh, year and uh, made sure that those got out in a timely manner and were done uh, properly. So you're going to hear a lot on the next slide about AGRI on, uh, on Thursday in committee and, and just what Mr. Savory was saying when we looked at the spike. Uh, 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 you know, for many years ago, we had the ethanol uh, producer payments in the state. And whether you like ethanol or not, you can't argue that what the state did is they invested about $30 million a year into creating an ethanol industry in Minnesota. Those were farmer-owned plants, and it worked. But at the time, in my previous job, we looked at the agricultural budget, and those payments at that time were 40% of the total agricultural budget. And we were worried when we tapped those payments were done, our ag budget would slide to less than one quarter of 1% of the state's budget. So we created this agri-fund legislators and different groups. And uh, again, you'll hear more about that in Saturday, but it sunsets this year. And so I really encourage you to extend that sunset and look at the good work that that does and keep our agricultural budget strong. Uh, collaboration is very important. Uh, oh, and so in, in that though too, I wanna say that we have things like value added grants, livestock grants, uh, all kinds of important things that are in that. Uh, our uh, marketing department also does things like Minnesota Grown, you might be familiar with where uh, farmers are selling Minnesota Grown products. We have over a thousand farmers that are in that that sell locally that really grew in COVID was maybe a good thing that came out of COVID. We have things like the good food access programs that helps things that are in say food deserts, uh, get uh, equipment for their grocery stores or pieces like that. Our new markets program, biodiesel task force or organic advisory task force, I mentioned egg in the classroom. Um, the, the marketing also is in charge of trade missions uh, hosting international buyers, uh, trade shows, uh, and we mentioned Minnesota Grown, a uh, wholesale directory for schools, restaurants, and growers, our farm to school program. So our uh, dairy and meat division is our next division that oversees and tell you one of the hardest things I open every month is our dairy uh, numbers for our state. And I just opened it this morning. And uh, last month we lost 25 dairy farms. So we're down under 2,000 here just in the last uh, last two months, we uh, that some of some of the cows dried off, so that number will go back up at some point. But you know, dairy's uh, something to be honest, that, and that's not just unique to Minnesota. That's the whole country. As we look at some of the smaller dairies, some consolidations. But our dairy and meat inspection, 
uh, does ensure that our dairy and food supply, uh, uh, by conducting uh, regulatory-based inspections, you can see there for dairy, meat, poultry, and eggs, that's very important. Uh, piece. Uh, we also are in charge of interstate commerce of dairy products uh, and uh, meat and poultry and respond to emergencies and outbreaks. Very important. I can't tell you how awesome our staff is. Uh, really well respected and uh, uh, when you, you have lettuce outbreaks, uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, our lab, our, our staff does a tremendous job keeping Minnesotans uh, and uh, uh, people in the United States safe. Um, we ensure food, safe food handling practices. Uh, we monitor uh, product safety, conduct outreach, and uh, you can read the rest of those, uh, but very important division uh, as we do. And also issue, issue certificates uh, to dairy meat companies so they can sell their products internationally. And I'll cover the, the food and feed safety division. I'm going to talk really quickly so that we can uh, get through our time. So um, I, I apologize. I don't always talk this, this fast. Um, so our food and feed safety division is one of our regulatory divisions that does uh, obviously incredibly important work. What we do is ensure the safety of the food supply through, uh, through work with produce growers and human and animal food manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. Um, so you'll see the list of things that we do there. Um, but again, uh, a, a response to food-related emergencies and, out, uh, and outbreaks, um, enforce regulatory requirements that make sure the food uh, for both human and animals are, are safe. Um, and then, of course, conduct regular, uh, regular assessments to ensure that the food safety uh, precaution measures are there. Um, another how we do this is conduct pre-operational reviews of facilities and operational plans to provide guidance on how to meet the regulatory requirements that are, are, are put in there by law. Um, we have our uh, commercial feed licensing and product listing, food handler's license, and cottage food producer registration. Just a quick side note on that. That's something you'll probably, you've heard a lot about already, and I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit more in committee later on. Um, that is a, a large program that we spent a lot of time growing uh, and, and learning from and working on over the years. Um, we do have over 7,000 7, total um, cottage food registrations in the state, and those continue to grow. Um, and of course, we'll again dive into that a little bit more, but I just wanted to, to add a little bit more about how that's a, a big piece that we'll be talking more about. Um, we use risk-based inspections to ensure sanitary, sanitary environments and safe food handling practices on farms and uh, food, human and animal food manufacturers and food retailers, collect samples, um, the, the whole gamut. So um, I'll, keep, I'll keep going to make sure we, we stay on time. We have our world-class laboratory that we're incredibly proud of. Um, one thing that I will say about this, this group um, that we were so grateful for is during the, the COVID outbreak, um, they, they came just to work every day um, to ensure that our food supply was safe and our environment was protected. So we're very grateful for them um, that, they, that they did come and, and report to the lab each, each day to, to ensure that all Minnesotans were safe. Um, so again, they assist in the regulatory enforcement and monitoring activities of the MDA, uh, respond to outbreaks and emergencies, support the protection of the environment through our work um, with the MDA divisions. We also work with the Minnesota DNR and the EPA very closely. Um, and then we also uh, make sure that we provide accurate data on which action can be taken or responsibility can be determined based upon the facts that they learn from their, their testing. Then the next uh, really important uh, division is our pesticide and fertilizer management division. And you can see there what we do, uh, pesticide fertilizer regulation, pro uh, protection from groundwater from egg chemicals, uh, emergency response, one of my favorite, I didn't always realize as commissioner, you get a call at four in the morning, uh, semis tipped over, or you got uh, uh, all kinds of something exploded with pneumonia. Uh, we have, again, tremendous staff, and it's really important piece of what we do to keep Minnesotans safe, uh, again, with the spills and cleanups as well waste pesticide collection, and of course our Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certification Program, uh, which we are nearing a million acres on and almost 1,300 farmers. Uh, some of the work we do is we work with farmers, regulated industry, and interested parties on the front end as much as possible. Uh, we employ 110 agronomists, soil scientists, and hydrologists. Uh, again, some, uh, 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 oh, one other note too there is that 40% of our folks there live in greater Minnesota. And I'd also like to say that one thing I've learned, and I knew before I was commissioner, that a lot of our staff are actually still on the farm. They still farm, they're very involved in uh, agriculture and live in those uh, rural areas where they work uh, uh, as well. Uh, many of our staff, of course, have graduate degrees, farm background, I just made that point, okay. Uh, and uh, again, we talked already about the budget. 
Uh, and I'll let you do that. Yes, then I'll talk about the Plant Protection Division. Um, so this is another division that we have uh, that has some regulatory components to it. They uh, protect natural and agricultural resources from invasive species, as the commissioner mentioned, emerald ash borer, uh, spongy moth, where was also probably heard of brown marmorated stink bug, uh, and a number of other ones that, uh, that we like to talk about and you'll hear more about. Um, protect market access for Minnesota plant and plant products help to facilitate fair and transparent marketplaces. We also have um, our wolf depredation and elk damage compensation program out of plant protection. It sounds a little odd, but it's a, it's a good place. It has a good home uh, in, in the plant protection division. Um, and how we do that is they uh, facilitate detection and management of invasive species, as I mentioned. Um, we inspect production areas to ensure standards are met for pest and pathogen thresholds, things like um, nursery inspections, seed potatoes. We also, our industrial hemp program is housed out of that, so, um, and they've been heavily involved in, in the cannabis conversation. Um, we also work on things like noxious weeds, so you'll hear uh, about Palmer amaranth and others. Um, we also do all of our seed certification out of that division. Um, we also provide oversight for grain and produce transactions to uh, prevent sellers from not being paid. I'm sure you've heard about some of the, the grain elevator failures that I'm sure we'll talk about in a, a, a later meeting. Um, and then again, as we talked about, verify and pay claims for damage from wolves or elk, as well as grants to prevent damage from those species. Then I'll talk quickly about the Rural Finance Authority and the Ag BMP program. Um, the Rural Finance Authority uh, administers five bond-funded, eight revolving loan, and one grant-funded program. Um, they finance at rates and conditions that are not available in, in the regular marketplace. So they're uh, really low-interest loans. Um, we also administer the beginning farmer tax credit out of that program, out of that um, division from our finance and, and budget division. They administer the new down payment assistance program, uh, grant program, thanks to the leadership of, of Chair Vang. Um, we can talk more about that. I, I think we're short on time, but we have a, a lot of exciting things about that program coming up. Um, we service over 742 loans, over $100 million. Um, and we have a very, very, very low default rate. Um, and we're very proud of this program. And it's, it's used quite heavily. So I'm sure you'll be hearing more from us uh, on, on things that we would like to do with the ERFA and, and um, opportunities that we see down the line. Uh, and then our Ag BMP loan program services over 4,000 loans and a portfolio of over $87 million. Again, that's a revolving loan program. So all that money comes back and it gets reinvested in the important programs that a lot of the counties are, are using. And how we do this, we have seven staff people that do all of those amazing things. Uh, they work with over 400 community banks that provide ag financing, so a lot of the ag lenders around the state. Um, we work with over 1,000 farmers per year for the beginning farmer tax credit. I think it's like about 11,000, tra I'm sorry, 1,100 transactions for that program alone. Um, and then the Ag BMP, as I said, works with all counties and over 360 lending institutions to provide an average of 668 loans per year. And I hope that was fast enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. We're very grateful for the time today. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, questions from the committee? Representative Nelson. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Vang and Commissioner. Uh, both of you, it's glad and good to be here. And uh, the um, ask about the drought, uh, you know, there was a relief package last year. And uh, I believe there was probably more requests than funds available. And also with the, uh, you know, 2022 was a dry year for some, not, thankfully not as severe, but is there uh, thoughts of maybe needing another round of drought relief or uh, maybe an additional package or anything? Uh, Commissioner Peterson? Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Nelson, you know, it's uh, something that we've thought about, you know, and, and really would like to hear more from the groups on that if that's something that they want to go and, and hear. It's been kind of quiet, I'd say. Uh, at, at the moment on like requests on but I think people are looking at it I think we're waiting to see like what came out of it because if you look at the drought relief that we passed last year for the 2021 drought and I do appreciate that because I as commissioner and uh, you know a lot of the work that went through it just to remind people um, we did 3,000 we passed the bill in May um, we had uh, 3,000 roughly applications. We were able to fund most of those. Uh, there was a few that didn't qualify. We had $8 million. We had $19 million in requests. So we had about, uh, the cap was, uh, uh, was it 7,500 or 7,000? Uh, but anyways, people got uh, on the average 42%. Uh, so 2,700 I think was the top payment uh, that people got. So you can see, uh, did we wanna make people whole? Uh, you know, or different things like that. Most people that talk to me, they, they appreciated what they got, you know, and they said it helped them. Like I, you know, try to say all along that it was gonna, you know, 
uh, help pay a bill or two, you know, so maybe help buy a load of hay, uh, make a payment on something and kind of recognize like what had happened during that drought. So we're open to that discussion, you know, as we look, uh, look at that and, and stuff. But at, at this moment, we're wanting to hear more. All right, uh, members, we are running a couple minutes behind schedule, so please keep your uh, questions brief and remarks uh, brief. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good to see you, Commissioner. Uh, I have a couple questions, just if you could. Uh, my understanding uh, is that uh, the regulation of feral hogs and mink uh, farms are diffuse uh, and fairly old regulatory uh, frameworks, and that the Department and the Board of Animal Health and the Department of Natural Resources have varied responsibilities. I would ask if you could work with the, the other agencies uh, with proposing cleaning up that language and providing a clear authority uh, to take us into the future rather than uh, the, the past. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Peterson? Yeah, real quick on, on uh, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Hansen on Feral hogs is something we're very concerned about. We do, we do have, uh, you know, mo the feral hogs we have right now are loose hogs that have we haven't been able to catch, and we do have some of those around the state that we watch very carefully because we don't want that to develop. It's amazing how they adapt. We do have some in North Dakota and Manitoba. I'm actually going to be in Manitoba next week to meet with some of the folks up there to make sure, like, what are we doing to control that? Because that will be a big issue. We do have statutes that we would like to update and appreciate you asking about that. And then just for your, you know, uh, again, learning things as commissioner, uh, we have about seven licenses we do for mink, and uh, but we think about three or four of them actually have uh, mink or chinchillas. So, a, but it's an important thing uh, that we'd like to work on. Thank you. So we'll, we'll continue to do that as we get into session. All right, any further questions from members of the committee? All right, thank you, Commissioner Peterson and Commissioner uh, Wobble for your time and testimony. All right, next we have on the agenda is uh, the Minnesota Board of Animal Health. Uh, Dr. Marianne Garcia and Dr. Courtney Wheeler, please proceed. Uh, please identify yourself before the committee and proceed. Thank you so much for being here today. Madam Chair and members, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. While we search for the slides, I'll go ahead and introduce us. I'm Dr. Marion Garcia, the state veterinarian since mid-September of last year. Prior to that, I have 20 years of experience as a poultry veterinarian working in the turkey industry. With me is Dr. Courtney Wheeler, who has been a senior veterinarian with the board since 2017. Prior to that, she worked as a field veterinarian with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and has served as a veterinarian in the U.S. Army, where she managed two veterinary treatment facilities and food audits for two installations. The veterinarians and staff at the Board of Animal Health have a breadth of experience, including work in the dairy sector, Minnesota Department of Agriculture, work in mixed animal practice, wildlife medicine, and a small animal veterinarian who has worked with breeders, animal welfare organizations, and animal shelters and rescues. Go to the next slide. We are a small agency. Currently, we have 41 personnel on staff. The board is comprised of four producers and two veterinarians. One of the producers is also a tribal member. Two of the producers' terms expire this month, and the governor will be appointing two new people to fill these positions. The mission of the Minnesota Board of Animal Health is to protect the health of the state's domestic animals through education and cooperation with veterinarians, producers, owners, and communities. We do this through intentional collaborations, program expertise, field outreach personnel, and a firm, fair, and consistent regulation of the laws designed to protect animal health. We work within a one health construct. In other words, we're part of an integrated system of agencies whose work complements each other. This will become evident as we discuss some of our specific problems. The One Health approach works to prevent and control outbreaks of zoonotic diseases, which are those that can spread between animals and people, protect food safety and security, reduce antimicrobial resistant infections, and protect global health. 
The board monitors for and investigates zoonotic diseases like rabies. Rabies is, an endem is endemic in Minnesota, meaning it is present in the wildlife of the state. Interactions between wildlife and domestic animals can result in rabies infection spread. The most common wild species to be infected are skunks and bats. In addition to educational outreach to veterinarians, animal control agencies, local law enforcement, and the public, the board has regula regulatory authority to ensure proper administration of rabies vaccinations and rabies official documentation. We'll start with our swine programs, and uh, we'll talk about African swine fever. Preparedness for this disease is a major focus of our swine programs. African swine fever, or ASF for short, is a viral disease of swine. There is currently no vaccine. It cannot be transmitted to humans. It is not a public health or food safety concern. First reported in 1921, ASF has spread to much of Europe and Asia, and as of 2021, the Caribbean. Currently, the U.S. remains ASF free, but we must remain vigilant and be prepared to respond. The board has been a national leader in implementing the U.S. Swine Health Improvement Plan known as SHIP. SHIP is designed to develop and implement a certification program of U.S. pork production sites, which would be focused on African swine fever and classical swine fever preparedness. The aim is to mitigate risk of disease introduction and provide a practical means of demonstrating freedom of disease outside of control areas. Such evidence would facilitate ongoing interstate commerce and provide a pathway towards resumption of international trade. The number of Minnesota sites enrolled in SHIP is second highest in the nation, a reflection of Minnesota's rank as second in the nation for swine production. Madam Chair, committee members, thank you for seeing me today. I'm Dr. Courtney Wheeler, Senior Veterinarian with the Board of Animal Health. I'm going to give a brief overview of our companion animal programs and talk a little bit about our Farm Survey Day program, highlighting some key points that may be beneficial as we move forward through the session. A reportable disease that illustrates the Board of Animal Health's own One Health work is canine brucellosis. CDC has classified canine brucellosis as, as a disease of rising concern. Antibiotics can help with symptoms, but the disease is not curable, and infected individuals, dogs, and humans commonly experience recur recurrence despite treatment. Dogs infected with canine brucellosis can have reproductive issues and intense spinal pain, but the majority of dogs showed no signs while still being able to, sh to shed the bacteria and bodily fluids and waste and spread the disease. The risk infection in most pet owners is low. However, canine brucellosis can cause significant disease in people who are immunocompromised, young, elderly, or pregnant. All cases of canine brucellosis are required to be reported to the Board of Animal Health, and we conduct extensive investigations with the Minnesota Department of Health to determine the origin of the infection and if people and other dogs have been exposed to an infected dog. The number of canine brucellosis cases in Minnesota has increased. In fiscal year 22, there were 14 infected dogs found from 27 investigations. The majority of these cases were in unowned dogs that were imported into Minnesota by animal rescue groups and they were already infected with the disease prior to importation. Canine brucellosis investigations are just a small part of our companion animal programming. The board licenses and inspects commercial dog and cat breeders and kennels. A commercial dog and cat breeder is defined by statute as a breeder that possesses 10 or more intact adult animals and produces more than five litters per year. A kennel, commonly referred to as an animal shelter, is defined as a facility that takes an abandoned, unwanted, or stray dogs and cats, and is not owned and operated by a municipality, or is not a foster-based organization where animals are kept in private homes as pets. These facilities are all inspected annually by trained Board of Animal Health district veterinarians and field staff. In December 2021, we formed a companion animal advisory task force comprised of representatives from animal welfare organizations, animal rescues and shelters, breeder associations, veterinarians, public health epidemiologists, tribal nations, and local animal control agencies. This task force meets regularly to address such issues as the lack of regulation of foster-based animal rescue organizations and examine import requirements for unknown dogs and cats in an effort to prevent the introduction of diseases into the state like cannabis losis. 
In fiscal year 22, there were 87 licensed kennels and 115 licensed commercial dog and cat breeders in the state. Five commercial breeders qualified for participation in our Breeder of Excellence program. This voluntary program allows commercial breeders to showcase how they go above and beyond routine inspection requirements. The program was launched in 2020 and interest and participation continue to grow as breeders more, learn more about the value of this program. Minnesota law requires that any person possessing farm cervidae, which includes deer, elk, and reindeer, must register their herd with the board. All, who are, all herd owners must comply with program requirements, which are intended to prevent the introduction and spread of chronic waste and disease, or CWD. CWD is a disease of cervidae caused by an abnormally shaped protein called the prion that can damage brain and nervous tissue. Exposure can occur through direct contact between animals or indirectly by contact with infected items and scavengers in the environment. In fiscal year 2022, 227 Minnesotans possessed farm cervidae. The number of registered herds in the state has continuously declined since 2013. The board is working with remaining registered herds, University of Minnesota partners, and the North American Deer Registry to further develop sound, evidence-based research to drive our decisions on how we move forward and mitigate the effects of chronic waste and disease. The USDA has provided funding to university researchers to closely examine risk factors that increase potential exposure of farmed herds to CWD. The board is also working with white-tailed deer farmers to understand if genetic selection can identify animals that are less likely to become infected with this disease. This approach has worked with another prion disease in sheep known as scrapie. Of the 227 herds currently registered with the board, the majority consists of white-tailed deer and elk. The majority of herd owners report that they engage in interstate commerce producing animals for breeding or hunting or for the production and sale of animal products. Minnesota is a net exporter of farm cervidae. In 2022, 106 domestic cervids were imported into the state and 780 animals were exported. Nationally, 29 states have confirmed CWD in wild cervids, cervids while only 18 states have confirmed CWD in farmed animals. To prevent the introduction of CWD through movement or importation of farmed animals, we regulate all farmed animals moving within the state or entering the state. Live cervidae or cervidae carcasses may not be imported into Minnesota from a herd that is infected with or exposed to chronic wasting disease. Before an animal may be imported, the importer must obtain a permit, which verifies that the importer is registered with the board's farm cervidae program and meets all requirements under law for possessing farm cervidae. Animals imported must be seen by a veterinarian prior to movement and must originate from a herd that has achieved the highest level for CWD surveillance status through a state-approved herd certification program. For any farm cervidae moved into or out of a Minnesota herd, the herd owner must submit a movement report to the board within 14 days of movement. Herd owners must identify every animal in their herd with a unique ear tag approved by the board. The individual tagged animals must be reported at least once per year when the herd manager completes an inventory of all animals in the herd. If an animal is moved into or out of a herd, the identification number of that animal, the animal's origin and destination, and the date moved must be reported. Any officially identified animal in the herd that dies or is slaughtered must be reported to the board, and if 12 months of age and older, the animal, animal must be tested for CWD. Since 2002, 13 herds have been identified as CW, CW positive, CWD positive, excuse me, and all herds have been depopulated to date. More than 1,500 animals in these herds were tested at time of depopulation, and only 54 were confirmed to be infected with chronic wasting disease. The most recent detection of CWD in a farm cervidae herd was in August 2022. The remaining 120 animals in this herd were depopulated in October, and all 120 of these animals tested CWD not detected. In the last five years, herd inventories confirm that an average of 8,000 cervidae are farmed in Minnesota annually. Since 2018, an average of more than 20% of animals were tested each year, with less than 1% of animals tested confirmed to be infected with chronic wasting disease. In 2021, slightly more than 1% of animals tested were confirmed to be infected. These infected animals all resided in two epidemiologically linked herds. 
In FY22, the board conducted 67 foreign animal disease investigations in domestic animals, including pigs, rabbits, poultries, and cows. Some of the disease investigated were foot and mouth disease in pigs and cows, rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus 2, and highly pathogenic avian influenza. High path AI, also known as bird flu, is an international disease affecting most areas of the world. It was most recently diagnosed in the U.S. in spring of 2022 and has spread throughout the country, affecting 47 states and 715 flocks, both commercial and backyard. The last outbreak of high path AI in the U.S. occurred in 2015, and at that time, it affected only 21 states and 232 flocks. The Minnesota response has been ongoing since March, with our latest case diagnosed on December 9th of last year. Minnesota has had the highest number of affected flocks of any state, mostly commercial turkeys. The majority of our cases have been in the poultry dense areas, as you can see on this map. But of note, it has been widespread throughout the state, including the Twin Cities metro area, and 38 counties have been affected. We use the National Incident Management System as the framework for our response. We set up an incident command post in Wilmer shortly after our first case was diagnosed as a physical location to direct on-scene control of the operations. After a positive flock has been identified, we increase surveillance in the area and permit movement for a minimum of 14 days. The increased testing is accomplished with the help of authorized poultry testing agents. These testing agents have gone through specific training by the Board of Animal Health on how to correctly obtain samples and submit them to our state laboratories. The National Poultry Improvement Plan is an industry-driven program. The plan outlines biosecurity measures that decrease the likelihood of high path AI entering a facility. The board audits each farm to ensure that biosecurity plans are in place. Case management of the inflected flocks is the responsibility of our field, trained field staff. Case management involves helping the infected premise owners through the depopulation, disposal, and disinfection steps until the site is ready for birds to come back. We have partnered with the University of Minnesota Extension to develop outreach materials for backyard producers who may not have direct relationships with a veterinarian. We have also hosted webinars to help train on the importance of biosecurity, as well as offering resources for mental health. Minnesota has a very diverse population with many having ties to poultry production. As a result, we have offered the resources in many languages and have participated in several radio interviews with question and answer being translated into different languages. We anticipate that we will be dealing with highly pathogenic avian influenza well into 2023. In the past, we had associated outbreaks solely on the presence of migratory birds who brought the virus with them. But based on surveillance of wild birds by the Department of Wildlife this year, we know that the virus has persisted in the state's wild bird population and will probably continue to affect farmed poultry. We're working with poultry veterinarians and the industry to minimize the impact of this virus, but the number of tools we have available to us is limited. What we've just presented is a snapshot of what the Board of Animal Health does. On a day-to-day -day basis, we also provide oversight of cattle, sheep and goats, and horses. We permit and inspect animal exhibitions, livestock auctions and markets, and work to advance animal disease traceability. We're a small agency with a big reach whose successes come from a collaborative approach to animal health. We serve all Minnesotans with a data-driven approach leverage the expertise of our program staff and the geographic reach of our field staff. And we'll be happy to come back with uh, any other input or answer any questions you may have at this time. Questions from the committee? Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Garcia, thank you for the presentation. The bird flu, it's uh, a problem that just doesn't seem to want to go away. Uh, 2015, it, it did diminish when the weather warmed up. This time around, it didn't. And uh, you mentioned you're relatively small in staff, and it takes a lot of manpower, people power, I should say, to, to handle a, a flock once it's been determined to be positive. 
do you think you have all the resources you need? What more do you need to continue this fight against uh, bird flu going forward, as you mentioned, into 2023? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. I will say, obviously, we don't do it all by ourselves. Uh, the Department of Agriculture is, is a big partner, and U.S. Department of Agriculture also um, pitches in. We've reached, I think I, I met someone who worked for the Forestry Department out there at the Incident Command Post last time, so we are a, a big group of people. But I will say at the, at the national level, there's certainly fatigue setting in. Um, some of the things we're starting to do is we are looking to um, – Anything that the industry accredited poultry veterinarians can pick up and do that we don't have to do. And we found a couple of things that they, they have been able to pick up for us. We're also working closely with the Department of Ag to get some subject matter experts trained out there in uh, the industry to do the composting, which will pick up a big piece of that. So we're looking at how can we share the, share the load already. Um, so, far the, uh, so far, the federal government has paid indemnity I, I guess that would be my biggest concern is if that were to go away, would we have a, uh, where would we go from there? Representative Anderson, follow up? No. Any further questions? All right. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, and thank you, Dr. Wheeler, for your testimony. I appreciate you both being here today. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Uh, next, we have on our agenda item is uh, the Agricultural Utilization, Utilization Research Institute. Uh, Director Dan Skogan and Executive Director Shannon, uh, please make your way. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, and uh, please identify yourself before the committee and you may proceed. Thank you, Chair Vang and committee members. Dan Skogan, uh, Director of Government and Industry Relations for the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute, or AURI. It's great to be before the Ag Committee once again here in the House. I uh, see some familiar faces, and uh, I see a lot of new faces, so uh, we hope that today we can shed some light on the work that AURI does, probably with some of your constituents. Um, AURI was created about 33 years ago by the uh, state legislature. Uh, it was a time of crisis in farming in Minnesota in that we were raising a lot of uh, product. We weren't getting a very good price for it, and good farmers were losing their farms. And uh, the legislature, in their wisdom, created AURI and tasked us with adding value to agricultural products. We do not work with the side of production agriculture. We work after the harvest is over and take those... Uh, bushels and those pounds and try to add value to them through the innovative ideas that entrepreneurs and small businesses have. And uh, Shannon uh, Schlecht is our executive director, is going to uh, be here today to uh, kind of tell our story, uh, what we did with our annual appropriation in the last year, and uh, we look forward to uh, your questions when we're done. Before I turn it over to Shannon, I do want to uh, say that we do have a lab in Wasika and one in Marshall, and anytime you want to take a tour uh, just get a hold of me and we'll set something up because uh, I think uh, Representative Vang has been on a, a tour through some of our labs and uh, Representative Nelson as well. And it really sheds some new light on what AURI is able to do with egg products in Minnesota. And uh, Chair Vang, I'll, I'll allow you, I guess, to call on Shannon Schleck for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Executive Director Shannon? Very good, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Shannon Schlecht. I'm the Executive Director of the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to share a little bit about uh, what the work that we've done over the last fiscal year uh, and the impact that we're having on Minnesota agriculture to, to benefit the industry. Uh, as Dan mentioned, we have uh, uh, locations around rural Minnesota. Uh, we have an office up in Crookston, Minnesota. We are in uh, Marshall, Minnesota with a pretty large footprint to do technical support. Uh, an analytical lab, a bioproducts lab, uh, a food laboratory, a meat laboratory, as well as a sensory laboratory uh, that we have uh, available to service entrepreneurs and businesses uh, at that site. Uh, additionally, we have a biomass or bioindustrial processing center in Wasika, uh, really looking at what are ways that we can um, add value to co-product streams uh, through work uh, on densification and dewatering mainly at that site. Uh, we do have an office at the U of M St. Paul office, and then about a third of our staff are virtual today. Uh, we have 35 people on staff, either full-time or part-time, uh, and we are governed by a board of directors consisting of 11 individuals of uh, commodity councils, uh, the general farm organizations, agribusiness, at-large members, and 
uh, the chairs of the um, Ag Finance Committees from the Senate and the House. Uh, we work uh, across the entire state uh, as an organization. Uh, this is just a map of our client services projects that we've done. Uh, so these are working with individual businesses across the, the state of Minnesota over the last 10 years. Uh, you can see that we, we touch a, a wide range, uh, a lot where agricultural products are produced and processed, uh, and working with small businesses, with cooperatives, with producers to commercialize their ideas uh, and move them forward. We also do a lot of statewide initiatives that aren't, re aren't represented here, uh, just because they, they do cover the entire state and we, we can't uh, allocate to a zip code in terms of the, the work that we're doing. Uh, just, uh, I think this is a great slide to show uh, just the, the busy nature of our work at ARI over a fiscal year in terms of trying to really uh, drive impact and benefit to the industry. Uh, last year, we uh, opened 114, or 117 different projects. Uh, we closed 114 projects and we worked on over 250 projects uh, across the state. Those are all focused, as Dan mentioned, on post-harvest, uh, right? looking at how do we add value, create market um, opportunities and market expansion. Uh, for the agricultural derived products that we produce here within the state of Minnesota. Uh, about six or seven years ago, we also started a, a new program called ARI Connects, uh, which you can see off on the side. Uh, this is really about creating awareness and educational opportunities around value-added agriculture. Uh, last year, we uh, conducted 29 different events, attracting nearly 2,500 participants. Uh, and you can see we're, we're acting um, more collaboratively state, or nationally and globally. Uh, with some of the participants that we're drawing into those programs uh, and of course always focused on, on what we can provide locally to drive economic uh, opportunities. You can see there as well we also had a budget of about five million dollars, uh, 80 percent of that from, from the state legislature through the appropriation process to drive those, those activities. Uh, we operate programs across um, four major blocks I would say. Uh, commercialization services are those technical and business um, consulting services to private businesses, uh, entrepreneurs and producers across the state of Minnesota. That's probably 50% of what we do as an organization. Uh, public research and initiatives, looking at what are gaps and in information uh, needs for industry to drive some new opportunities forward. Uh, and then the ARI Connects program that I just mentioned. And a new one that we're, we're rolling out and, and trying to create some enthusiasm around is our Entrepreneur in Residence program. Uh, and this is uh, the opportunity for entrepreneurs, small businesses that have novel ideas uh, to come into our laboratories and to use, utilize our equipment that we have that the state's invested in ARI to help uh, overcome some of those early stage um, innovation hurdles that they have without having to uh, purchase that equipment up front uh, right, and be able to, to leverage the, the dollars that you provided to ARI uh, to advance some of those early stage ideas that, uh, that innovators have. Uh, I'll touch very briefly on our major uh, of areas of focus that we have uh, for agricultural dry products. Uh, food uh, is a major one. We heard about food from the Department of Agriculture earlier. Uh, just uh, we're seeing a growth in the food innovation, the food uh, um, ecosystem here within the state of Minnesota. Uh, when we look at the number of uh, interactions that we've had as an organization, they've continued to, to grow. I think when we started, we, ha I, we had one food scientist on staff seven years ago. Today we have three, uh, and we've added two meat scientists as well. Uh, we're just seeing, continuing to see a lot of interest, a lot of need in terms of food safety requirements, uh, nutrition facts panels, shelf life stability, just you know, um, the basic needs of getting a product on, onto the marketplace. Uh, we've seen a lot of growth in the, uh, the meat processing and local and regional meat processing over the last uh, several years. Uh, we've we've uh, brought on new expertise uh, and individuals to help in that sector as well. Uh, and we've had a lot of really interesting initiatives looking forward around you know, what are some opportunities for, um, for our agricultural producers I think one that's really interesting is looking at wheat digestibility issues, looking at the FODMAP, uh, ATI work that we did with the, the Department of Agriculture and the University of Minnesota. You know, looking at our, our wheat varieties going back uh, to the early 1900s, right, in terms of have we unintentionally done something to make wheat harder to digest. Uh, right, we looked at the genetics, we looked at the processing to see, you know, what are, are there some niche opportunities for those, uh, that segment of the population that, that has irritable, irritable bowel issues, right, with the uh, consumption of some of our major uh, ag agricultural crops that we produce here. Uh, the growth in plant proteins, we worked with the Wild Rice um, um, uh, Promotion Council, right, to look at what is the uh, protein quality, what are some new opportunities there as well. Uh, commercial kitchens, we see a, a lot of interest around, right, as we see uh, the, um, you know, cottage food producers needing to move into the, the next uh, stage facilities. Uh, Bold Growth is a collaborative program 
that we have with Embold and the uh, Naturally Minnesota Network to help scale growing uh, food entrepreneurs as well. So just a, a lot of activity going on there uh, where we're doing business development, market expansion, as well as that, that technical assistance. Hopefully you've tried a couple of the, the logo uh, products up there, smoothies and uh, simples, uh, some, some really fun, fun new products that are out there on the marketplace, as well as uh, um, Dashfire as well uh, that are listed there. Co-products is really looking at some of our, our um, secondary processing streams and how do we add value to those versus them going to a, a waste uh, um, or to a landfill. Uh, that really usually comes down to looking at fuel, feed, and fertilizer uses, but also sometimes into food uh, uses as we, as we look at more upcycled food opportunities. Uh, and it really becomes an economic question as to how do you uh, look at making the, the logistics of that operational, uh, concentrating the, the, uh, you know, the, the value added nutrients there, uh, and then I'm um, seeing, can you make a process work to, to get that onto the marketplace? Our team in Wasika is, um, does amazing work in this area in terms of looking at product opportunities, right, that might be going to a landfill uh, and really looking at upcycling those, creating another value stream uh, to make businesses more viable uh, as they, they work on their um, economics and their, their P&Ls as well. Uh, hemp decortication, oil seed processing, we continue to see a lot of interest. Uh, right, and then just uh, I think this team does a great job of connecting the dots. You know, what, what might be one person's waste stream can be another person's value stream. Uh, and they do a great job of finding those uh, companies across Minnesota where we can match up those, those opportunities. Renewable energy, uh, we continue to do a lot of work with, with ethanol and biodiesel producers. Uh, what we've really seen a lot of interest in the last one or two years has been renewable natural gas as well as the hydrogen economy. Uh, and what are opportunities for agriculture with green ammonia, uh, with hydrogen, as uh, we look at lowering carbon intensity, uh, carbon scores for, for the different products. Um, the uh, the um, renewable natural gas market, I, I'm amazed at the interest that, that we're seeing there. Uh, we've added new um, um, equipment, uh, right, to help service that, that industry as well, to look at optimized feedstocks. Uh, what is the renewable, renewable natural gas potential? How does it fit into the Natural Gas Innovation Act that was passed a couple of years ago? Uh, here um, with the, the Minnesota legislature as well. Uh, and then bio-based is really about looking at how do we uh, replace petroleum products uh, using our Minnesota feedstocks that we have here uh, in terms of renewable opportunities. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Minnesota soybean uh, on this through a collaborative effort of looking at um, oil seed uses into road preservation products. You know, everything from how do we extend the life of an asphalt road to extending uh, concrete uh, preservation and bridge decks and things as well. Uh, as well as uh, dust control uh, using a, a different uh, soybean drive product. So just a, a lot going on there. You've, I, we've talked about this in the past during different hearings, uh, but it continues to be a, a, an, an interesting area. Uh, our egg, egg innovator of the year last year um, was New Starch Solutions. Uh, they are actually in the, the packaging space using uh, different starch materials from our crops uh, for uh, packaging peanuts and laminate sheets as well uh, that are biodegradable and, and replacing styrofoam as we look at the increased uh, e-commerce uh, right, and they just seem to be right on trend from sustainability standpoint, right, to, uh, to what we're seeing there as well. So uh, some really innovative efforts that are going on there. Uh, just briefly, again, on our ARI Connects program, um, right, I talked about the events. We also do thought leader events. Uh, this uh, uh, advent to a hybrid world allows us to bring in a lot of national expertise now, um, ma matching up with our Minnesota expertise uh, to look at gaps and areas that ARI could focus on moving forward. Uh, we've done this around anaerobic digestion, around fertilizer, uh, around um, um, ethanol and renewable fuels as well. Uh, fields of innovation is looking at uh, niche crop opportunities and new crop opportunities. So think of some of the forever green crops that we're working with them on in terms of what are the market opportunities as they're developing the crops and, and trying to, to match those up uh, as we go forward. Uh, webinar Wednesday is our, um, every second Wednesday we do an educational opportunity around different, different ideas that we see that we, would, that we want the Minnesota industry to be aware about uh, and sharing information there. Our Renewable Energy Roundtable really focus on biofuels and then our new uses form, uh, which is our signature event where we partner with Compere Financial and uh, Georgetown's Rural Opportunity Initiative uh, to talk about invent, um, trends in investment in food and agriculture as well as value added opportunities. Uh, this is just a, a list, uh, I'm not gonna um, spend time on this, but uh, just some of the examples of public um, initiatives and events that we've done over the last uh, fiscal year. Uh, that we either have completed or are currently working on. So, so a long uh, list of opportunities, right, that continue to come across. Uh, and almost all of these are done in collaboration with different entities, right? So it's not just AURI uh, driving, driving these. We're, we're working on them. We're finding partners, right, to make sure that there's an industry pull uh, and opportunity there to, to move these ideas forward. Uh, meat and livestock, uh, just continue to see a lot of interest here. 
uh, the, um, the Mobile Meat Slaughter Grant that uh, ARI was to administer from the Minnesota Legislature. We've gone through that process, awarded that to Minnesota Farmers Union, and they are moving that, that forward as well. We'll have a, a report to the chairs uh, here before, uh, before February. Uh, we've now added two meat scientists uh, to really work on um, providing assistance. And the funding that the legislature uh, provided to, for us to hire a meat scientist allowed us to leverage that with the USDA. Uh, and now we have two cooperative agreements uh, working um, on meat, meat processing uh, with them. So it's been a, a great way to expand our team to leverage the dollars uh, and to really um, drive opportunities for the Minnesota uh, industry here in terms of providing technical and business support. I'm going to skip over that, that, that one uh, a quick. Uh, and then just looking, look forward here a little bit in terms of um, you know, where, where we're seeing the next fiscal year uh, and, and needs uh, and gaps for, for ARI and for the industry. Uh, one is, is um, we're seeing a lot more requests for, for tests, uh, analytical needs that industry is looking for, and how do we fill some of those needs through either equipment upgrades or through uh, third-party services. Uh, renewable natural gas, uh, we hosted an event in December uh, we had uh, Vanguard Renewables that was in um, companies from Wisconsin, companies from Minnesota. Uh, right, we've got now in, in uh, Minnesota the, the largest biogas producer from Europe is is based in in St. Paul. Right, Every, there's a lot of interest and a lot of people looking at renewable natural gas markets uh, here within the, the state of Minnesota. Uh, American Biogas Council um, puts Minnesota eighth in terms of potential out of 50 states in terms of generating renewable natural gas. So just uh, potentially a lot of opportunity that we could explore there that would be beneficial to, to rural Minnesota uh, and meeting some of the um, um, renewable, uh, not, renewable energy goals as well. Uh, and then small foods, cottage foods, I've already mentioned. Uh, a lot of interest in sustainable proteins. We've been involved in several collaborations over the last year looking at what can we do around traditional proteins and novel and alternative proteins. Uh, Co-manufacturing commercial kitchens uh, in terms of that, that food ecosystem that's expanding, how do we you know, provide those next uh, opportunities in terms of scale up for them. Uh, hydrogen, green ammonia I mentioned, and, and then I'd say the last area that we see interest in is fermentation. Uh, and uh, increasingly so in terms of some of the agricultural drive waste products using uh, microbiology to create a higher value, um, the higher value out of chemicals or new products uh, through fermentation processes. And then finally, I'll just end on, on the why uh, for ARI. Uh, we are um, you know, always driven by impact to benefit Minnesota. Uh, what I am, am proud of is, is clients report to us on right this 50% of the work that we do, and this is 50% of the, our clients reporting here. Uh, 291 million in new um, new sales per year in terms of market expansion that we've helped create for for the agricultural industry across Minnesota. We've helped them de-risk uh, investment in, in new capital and equipment across the state of 118 million and 413 jobs, and that's over the last five years. Uh, and then help to de-risk um, and drive new market opportunities forward that they expect they will invest 316 million more in new capital uh, and create 860 more jobs in the next five years. Uh, so really uh, trying to drive that return, uh, right, and that benefit to, uh, to Minnesota agriculture is what the, uh, the staff is driven by. Uh, they love to see those ideas out on the, the commercial marketplace. Um, and, uh, and then I'll just end uh, right over 33 years of partnership with the state legislature. We've had, uh, I think, over 1,800 client projects across Minnesota. Uh, right, and um, just a great state for food and egg innovation. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Questions from the committee? All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Director Dan and Executive Director Shannon, for being here today. We always appreciate you guys coming here to testify. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Uh, well, that is our agenda for today. I know that has been a lot of information. And so members uh, on your committee folder, there is a save folder. So if you would like to keep these presentations uh, for uh, further review, uh, you can keep it in there on that save folder. Um, and with that, our next meeting uh, is Thursday, January 12th, 2023. And uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.